Hi, I'm Leonie from Spines and Splines and today I'm going to run you through the process of building this guitar, which I made as part of Tom and DIY Kit Challenge 22. And I made it because I like making things, but also ever since I started playing guitar, I've wanted a pink guitar and it's quite difficult to find a fun, vibrant pink guitar for a reasonable price or any price at all. So I thought I'd make my own. I chose the ST style kit, which is the Strat style kit. And the reason that I chose this one is that it's the most different from my current guitar, which is this uh, Squire Bullet Competition Orange Mustang, which is a short scale guitar that's got two humbucking pickups. And so I chose the Strat because it's got a different style of pickup that makes a different sound. It's a full scale guitar and it's got a wiggle stick, which is always fun. So I'm gonna run you through the process of making it now. There were some challenges along the way, not from the kit. The kit itself was very easy to make, which was great, but you know, some challenges with, with other things. And, but overall it was pretty fun, so let's go. I don't use acrylic paints very much, so I had to buy some. And I decided that because I was gonna be putting a lot of time into the guitar, I wanted to use a really good quality paint. So I ordered some golden brand acrylics from Jackson's in the UK as my local art store doesn't sell these. I got a few other things I needed at the same time and fun fact, my order total came to 69 euro, which is the same price that I paid for the guitar kit. I decided then and there that I'd be naming the guitar Jolie as a nice little nod. I bought quinacridone magenta, interference blue and zinc white and I ended up buying a second tube of zinc white locally along with some medium that has sparkles in it. I also bought my varnish locally as those kinds of products can be difficult with delivery if they can't be sent by road. I also used a tube of titanium white and gesso that I already had. And I used specific brushes from my collection for priming and varnishing. And my painting brushes were a variety of flat and filbert shapes with a tiny little round brush for touching up spots. Flat brushes are great for all round work and filberts are really great for blending and softening areas. I also used a couple of other things not shown here, like palette knives and a pack of disposable palettes for mixing my colours. I ended up ordering some extra fine sandpaper in 1000 and 1500 grit, because none of the shops where I live sell anything even close to this, and I used a low-tack washi tape for masking all my edges. While I was waiting for my kit to arrive, I tested out some ideas for the design on some scrap cardboard made into a painting panel, which incidentally came from the very first guitar I ever bought from Tommen. Then my kits arrived and I could start on the guitar itself. I'd watched a couple of other kit build videos in preparation for this and I picked up some great tips from one of the Guitar Geek videos in particular, which I'll link in the description. On recommendation from that video, I started by going through all the kit parts and sorting out the screws and whatnots together and labelling them so I wouldn't accidentally use the wrong thing or have to spend time figuring out what screws I needed in the middle of putting everything together. On recommendation from that same Guitar Geek video, I also decided to do a dry fit of the guitar before painting, just to check that everything was working and to figure out if I needed to make adjustments to anything. I'm really glad I did this because I noticed that some of the pilot holes for the pit guard were misaligned, and I also got to get all of my dumb assembly mistakes out of the road before it actually mattered. When I'd pulled the guitar apart again, I filled those misaligned holes with some ancient wood filler I found in a toolbox. The shape of a Strat guitar is very curvy and comfortable to play, so I didn't really need to make any changes to the shape of the body. But I did decide to make one or two completely frivolous changes purely because I thought it would look cool. One of these was recessing the neck plate of the guitar, which is used to reinforce the join between the neck and the body. I don't have a router or any power tools that would have made this easier, so I carved that area away with my printmaking woodcut tools and smoothed it out with some files and chisels.
When the carving was done, I sanded the body of the guitar back to smooth it all out and get rid of the pre-existing sealer. I probably would have been fine leaving that sealer on, but decided to play it safe and start fresh, especially as I wanted to prime the guitar with white gesso anyway to make sure my colours were really vibrant. After that I redrilled the pilot holes for the pit guard and I masked up the edges of the cavities so that I could keep them relatively clean and free of paint. The priming process was basically the same as I use for any painting, which is two or three layers of gesso sanded smooth after each layer dried. Gesso is a kind of priming paint with chalk in it. It stops the surface that you're painting on from absorbing all the paint, and it also gives that surface a fine tooth so that the paint will stick to it properly. A lot of people spray the finishes and paint on their guitars, but I work in a really small studio in my house, and I don't have anywhere reliable that I can safely use for spray paints. So all my priming, painting and varnishing was done by hand with a brush, which can make some things difficult when you're painting an object shaped like a guitar. I drew a rough outline for my design onto the guitar with a watercolour pencil using masking tape and a ruler as a guide. I used the watercolour pencil because I knew I'd be able to easily blend it with the paint and I wouldn't have any dark lines showing or bleeding through. If you use a really opaque paint that might not be much of an issue, but apart from the titanium white I knew that all my colours were pretty transparent and the lines could be an issue if I didn't pay attention. When I was doing my test painting I freehanded everything, thinking I might like a more painterly finish. But when it was done, I decided I wanted it to be much more bold and graphic with flat, clear colours. The only way to do this was to mask out all the edges and paint the guitar very methodically. I've done a little bit of this kind of hard edge art before, but not much, and it's actually quite difficult to do well. I learned a few little tricks as I went that made it easier, and I'll point those out when I get to them. I'm a printmaker primarily, and if I was painting this design on a Telecaster kit, I'd probably screen print it instead, because tallies are flat and you can get really sharp, clean lines with screen printing. Strats are all curves though, so that wasn't an option. And to be honest, I think part of the reason that I went with this particular kind of tessellated patterning is because all those angles are a huge contradiction with the shape of the Stratocaster style guitar. So when I was ready to paint, I started carefully masking out each shape with my low-tech washi tape and layering up the paint. I mixed each shade of pink individually from the quinacridone magenta and either the zinc white or the titanium white, depending on the colour that I wanted. Titanium white's really opaque and can make a colour too light too quickly if you're not careful. The zinc white is very transparent and you can be more efficient with how much of the coloured paint that you use important because the magenta paint was much more expensive than the white paint. I learned pretty quickly that I'd need to do multiple layers of paint to get a nice even finish, and also that I'd need to stop rinsing my brush out in water without properly drying it between colours. The wet brush loosened up the heavy body paint too much and it bled at the corners of the tape a bit. When we first moved to Dublin about five years ago, we lived in this house that had been renovated on the cheap. The kitchen was painted in a dark colour, and the landlord had bought a really big fancy fridge, but put it in a spot that made it really difficult to fully open the fridge door and pull out the crisper drawers properly. So we needed to move the fridge across a bit to actually be able to use it. 
It was at that point that I discovered that when they'd painted the walls, they hadn't bothered to move the fridge first and they just painted around it. So we had to look at a patch of unpainted wall for two years. I vowed then and there to never take shortcuts with paint. I know nobody except me will really be able to see the back of this guitar when I'm playing it, but it's for me to make me happy, so thanks to that fridge memory, I made the back almost as fancy as the front. I went through a few different shades of pink for the solid colour areas of the guitar and I eventually decided on one and mixed up a jar of that colour so that I'd have it on hand for touch-ups later. Ideally I'd have chosen the background colour first and painted that in before doing the feature parts, but all I decided going in is that I wanted the guitar to be pink and geometric. Nothing else specific had been planned out and I made all the colour decisions as I went. If I was doing it again, I would probably plan it out a bit more methodically, as it would save a lot of time, but there's also something enjoyable about not quite knowing what something is going to look like when it's done. As it stood, after finishing the base colour and pulling back all the washi tape, I wasn't super happy with the precision of the edges, and I decided to sand everything back and go over the whole thing again, doing everything more carefully, specifically making sure that the edges of the tape were well stuck down to try and keep the lines as crisp as possible. Eventually I got to a point where I was happy with the paint job and ready to varnish, hooray! I did a few layers of this Winsor & Newton satin varnish that was the only thing available from the craft supply shop near where I live. It went on fine but I decided it wasn't shiny enough so I went back and bought the same varnish in the gloss finish. I hadn't actually planned to use it yet, I was going to do another layer of the satin and then finish off with the gloss because I hadn't tested it yet. But both the bottles look the same and I accidentally picked it up and started using it before I realised. That was when disaster hit. For whatever reason, the gloss varnish reacted really badly with the layers of paint and varnish that I'd already put down and it seemed like it was actually dissolving those previous layers and pulling them up. I tried to fix it up a bit then left it to dry. With this varnish, the instructions were to leave for 24 hours between each coat, which was what I'd been doing. So I'd already spent several days by this point varnishing and I had to sand it all off. A lot of the paint was sanded back as well and I lost a week of work in that one moment. To be honest, I considered at this point making it a relic guitar. I tried to convince myself that the finish looked good. But no, that's not what I wanted, that's not what I started to do with this guitar, so I took a little bit of a break and decided that I had to start painting again. In the meantime, I'd been doing some work on the neck of the guitar. The headstock on this particular kit is just a big chunk of wood that you can shape in any way you want. In one regard, this is frustrating because it can be quite difficult to cut if you don't have a woodworking setup, which I currently don't have. On the other hand, I'm super picky when it comes to guitar headstock shapes, so I'm really pleased that I got to pick my own. Considering the tools that I had access to and the design on the rest of the guitar, I decided on this angular, faceted headstock design. Originally I tried to cut it with my electric jigsaw, but I struggled to clamp the neck due to the shape and the curves, so I couldn't safely use the jigsaw. Also my workbench was a plastic chair, which didn't help one bit. I ended up using various hand saws and files to get the shape that I wanted, then I sanded the whole thing smooth and painted it. Before painting I did some work on the guitar frets. 
The whole neck was in pretty good shape already, but there was a little bit of corrosion and some of the frets looked a little high. So after masking the fingerboard, I cleaned up the frets with steel wool, used my printmaking scraper tool to slightly take down some of the higher frets, and then I used my printmaking burnisher tool to polish them all and attempt to get rid of any sharper edges. The back of the neck is already super smooth straight out of the kit with some sort of sealer on it. I could have left that and had a perfectly good guitar neck, but I decided I could make it even better. I started by sanding off the sealer to my finest grade of sandpaper, which was 1500 grit. Then I wiped on and buffed back the neck with linseed oil and finished it off by wiping on a beeswax wood polish and buffing that back. The neck is so smooth and silky now and I'm super pleased with how it came out. Now this guitar's name is Jolie, but I decided to put my own band name on the headstock instead, which is Hot Pink Halo. I masked out three sections before painting, then figured out how the text would be laid out, and carved this away with my printmaking woodcut tools. The three tools I ended up using here were a woodcut knife around the edges, a very small Japanese V tool, and a regular V carving tool. If you're doing something like this, make sure to go slowly and carefully and cut away from your hands because it can be really easy to slip and cut yourself and playing guitar with cuts on your fingers is never fun. Another little tip I have for carving text is to ignore how you would normally form a letter if you were writing and make all your parallel cuts together. It's totally okay to do half a letter and then spin whatever object you're carving to finish off the shapes of the letter that run in a different direction. Usually in printmaking you have to carve all of your letters backwards because they reverse when you print, so it was a particular novelty for me here to carve my letters normally on this project.
After all the carving was done, I took the neck down to my kitchen and heated up some of the fluoro pink encaustic wax that I found at the art shop in town. I tested this on some scrap before doing it to make sure it would work, and when I was happy, I smoothed the melted wax over the carved text with a palette knife, then scraped the excess away carefully so that it was only left in the grooves. Originally I was worried that the colour would clash too much with the pink in the paint, but in the end I think having this different shade of pink for the text worked really well and helps it stand out from the paint job in a really fun way. When the headstock was done, I conditioned the fretboard with some lemon oil because it looked a bit thirsty. Then I cleaned up the nut a bit with my superfine sandpaper and put some graphite in the grooves. The graphite acts as a lubricant in the nut and helps the strings move back and forth when you tune the guitar. Because I'd had issues with my varnish and hadn't bought a new one yet, I decided to finish the whole headstock with the wood wax polish. I was also a bit concerned about being able to mask off the area with the text well because it's filled with wax. It worked and looks fine, but I would like this headstock to be shiny like the rest of the guitar ended up. The first upgrade I've planned to make to this guitar is to replace the tuners sometime in the future. So I think that when I replace those, I'll try and carefully mask the wax text areas, remove the wax polish on the paint, and varnish it with the same Liquitex high gloss varnish that I ended up using on the body of the guitar. Now it's time for my other little frivolous touch on the neck plate. Because I put my band name on the headstock, I decided that I should customise the neck plate with the name of the guitar itself. I used my printmaking engraving tools for this, and to be honest it was incredibly difficult. I usually use these tools to engrave hard woods and soft metals like zinc and copper, and this neck plate is made of something incredibly hard and I had to sharpen the tools almost constantly. I would have etched it, but A, I couldn't remember where I'd put my copper sulfate, and B, I don't know exactly what the metal alloy is that's used for the plate, and I didn't want to accidentally create a noxious gas in my house by accidentally etching the metal with an incompatible chemical solution. So I spent literal hours carving it by hand instead, and when I was done, I used the same encaustic wax technique to embed pink wax in the engraved lines to give them some life. When the neck was finished, I set about painting the body one last time. In the original round of painting, I saw a tip that you could seal the tape by painting the previous colour that you used as a base layer, but because I was mixing my colours on the fly I couldn't really do this. Later on I found another tip that said you could paint a layer of clear medium as the first layer, then let this dry to seal the edges of the tape, and go over the top with your colour. I'd bought some wooden panels along with my new varnish, and I used these to test out the medium sealing technique and the new varnish before using them on the guitar. 
The medium that I bought had sparkles in it and those particles were too big for the tape and made some of the edges uneven when I tried to use it as a sealer, but it worked really well as a sparkle medium in the paint. I also tried using the interference blue paint that I'd originally bought and this is a very transparent colour that has super fine metallic particles in it that shine different colours from different angles, but it's almost completely transparent face on. Because the particles in this were so fine, it ended up working really well to seal the tape and I used this as a method to paint the guitar with the edges as crisp as I could possibly make them. Because I was masking and painting so many shapes on the guitar, this added some unevenness and complexity to the masking process and occasionally the interference blue would bleed slightly in the corners of the shape. I was usually able to scrape this away lightly with a sharp blade or touch up those spots with my tiny round paintbrush as I went, so it wasn't too much of an issue. When the paint had dried for three full days, I was able to start layering up my new varnish. As I mentioned, I travelled a little further afield and bought a bottle of Liquitex High Gloss Varnish. I started in on the test paintings first before varnishing the guitar, but the other great thing about this varnish is that it has a much shorter curing time between layers, so I was able to reapply it every three hours. This kind of brushed on varnish needs to dry flat as it's self leveling so I still had to flip the guitar body when one side had dried so that I could do the other side and doing the edges of the guitar was a little bit tricky. I ended up doing a few thin layers then sanding back with a very fine sandpaper then another few layers sanding back again then I finished off with around nine layers total. This evened out the slightly raised edges on all the painted shapes a lot and I may even add another couple of layers of varnish sometime in the future to make it really, really super smooth. When the varnish was finished and dry, I carefully removed all of my masking from the cavities in the body and put the guitar together. I was originally considering shielding the guitar with copper tape, but after doing the test build, realising that nowhere near me sells copper tape and having YouTube aggressively recommend super long guitar shielding videos to me for a full week, I decided that it wasn't something that I really wanted to do. I didn't notice any excessive hum when I tested out the guitar the first time and after doing the final setup the sound is even better, so I'm pleased that I didn't go out of my way to buy more things for a process that I didn't really end up needing. Putting these guitar kits together is really super easy. All the components are pre-soldered and all you need to do is plug in the separate parts and screw everything down to get a working guitar.
The instructions indicated to wrap the ground wire around a little raised part on the claw hook that goes in the tremolo cavity on the back of the guitar, but I decided to use my terrible soldering skills instead to hold the wire down a little more securely. By the time I had everything together and was ready to set the guitar up properly, I realised that I'd used all my instructions as paint protection on my desk. I did a simple setup on my Mustang after I bought it, so I was vaguely familiar with what I needed to do, but the Strat style guitar has a different bridge system that complicates things a little bit. First I restrung the guitar with some nice Daddario strings which is one of the easiest and most accessible things that you can do to make a cheap guitar sound good. After watching a few videos, I learned that I'd need to adjust the spring tension on the tremolo block first. After doing that, I adjusted the action height on the strings, then used the screws on the bridge to correctly adjust the intonation. I'd checked the neck to see if I needed to make any adjustments to the truss rod, but it was already pretty great and I didn't need to touch that. The final thing I did was screw in the whammy bar, plug into the amp and adjust the pickup height as I was playing until it sounded good and loud. And that's it, that's the whole process of making this Harley Benton kit guitar from Tommen. It was a super fun process and any frustrations I had along the way were entirely due to my own ridiculous standards. Well, my own ridiculous standards and one bottle of terrible varnish. And now I have this amazing pink guitar. I do hope that more guitar makers start offering fun, vibrant pinks as a colour option, and I think with those John Mayer guitars and a few others, it's starting to happen. But in the meantime, I get to play this amazing, ridiculous thing. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like, subscribe and leave a comment. In the description you'll find links to the videos I talked about, and there's also links there to my website, Patreon page, Facebook, Instagram, and some affiliate links to art stores where you can buy some of the art supplies I used for this project. And there's also an affiliate link to my page on Tommen where you can buy this kit. And there you get to enjoy the guitar noises. Thanks for watching. Cheers. Bye.